Hey everyone, this is Pathmetrics. Welcome to episode two of my Mixing Loud with Clip to Zero video series. In this video, we're going to talk about why you want to use Clip to Zero gain staging. Why? Why even do this? Uh, I'd like to point out before I start that this is going to be a ongoing series uh, building out this playlist called Mixing Loud with Clip to Zero. It's on my channel. I recommend you subscribe and keep your eye on that playlist to learn all about the information that's coming in this series. I'm going to be talking about all these subjects. Right now we're focusing on the first meaty one, which is why. Why do you want to use this? In this video, we're going to talk about um, this particular song. Well, it's really more of a beat than anything else. Um, but I'm going to use it to demonstrate the main points of this video. And to understand why you want to use Clip to Zero gain staging, uh, it helps if we define what we mean by gain staging, because that means a couple different things. And then what I hope this video is going to convince you of is that this approach enables you to actually work against your reference tracks in a predictable manner. Pr traditional production advice given to newbies does not work. <laughs> Everyone tells you, listen to masters, listen to reference tracks, make your mix sound like the reference track, and then you get to the mastering stage and try to make a final push for some competitive loudness for the genre you're working in, and your mix just sounds like total crap when you try to make it loud. And so you have this great mix, and you wonder why it sounds like crap when you try to make it loud. Well, Clip to Zero helps you avoid all that mess, and I'm going to demonstrate that with this song in this video. Um, the other th two very, very important things that I haven't stressed much in my earlier Clip to Zero videos, one of the big, big benefits is it forces you, this method forces you to be very aware of and to control the dynamics of every single signal across every track and bus in your project. This is super critical. Most of us starting out have no clue how all of our different signals are summing together and how you just don't have any idea what your signals look like. And you're working only by ear. And yeah, you should mix by ear, but damn it, you should also use good metering tools and see and understand and visualize what's going on with your, with your signals. That's why we have metering tools. That's why you have spectrum analyzers. That's why you have this type of analyzer, that type of analyzer, because they are useful. Yes, your ears are the final judge, but your eyes have to help. And so I'm going to talk about how my method really forces you to know what those signals look like and how they're interacting with each other. And then finally, this is another one that I've never really talked about before, but it, it's kind of the heart of the matter. When you when you work at a really high RMS in a very low dynamic range so that you can be loud, right? This forces you to also clip at all of your buses, all the points where different tracks are summing together as they roll up towards the master. And we never think about how all the different tracks are summing at each group. And... By, by clipping at the buses, you start hearing flaws. You start really noticing flaws in decisions you've been making about your arrangement and composition, about your sound design choices, and about your mixing decisions. So Clip to Zero is just like a, a magnifying glass. It's like a microscope that just instantly shows you problems. And so you fix those problems up front. And by the time you get to final mix down and mastering, piece of cake, because you, you've, you've run into all the problems early instead of late. Okay, so let's see if I can demonstrate this. Um, just briefly, check out this song. Now, 
Now you'll notice it's very quiet, right? First of all, we're following the standard YouTube advice. Oh my gosh, you have to leave 6 dB of headroom on your master. I've even seen frickin' web pages by prof supposedly professional mastering engineers saying, when you send me your mix, you know, your mixes, make sure you're leaving 6 dB of headroom on the mix. And it's like, no, no mastering engineer worth their salt needs that. You can give them something right up to 0 dB peaking on your master, right? Hell, if you give them a 32-bit float balance, you can be giving them something that's clipping the master and going over zero on the master because it's not really peaking underneath. They can take that file you give them at 32-bit float and just pull the fader down and pull those peaks right out from the zero dB ceiling, and there's your track, pristine, with all the original peaks in it, right? So this whole advice about negative six headroom is bullshit. <laughs> I'm sorry, just gonna leave that right up front. So this, this is following typical YouTube advice in other ways. Notice that the kick track, the drums track, is the loudest track in the mix. It's peaking at negative four. Everything else is peaking much lower. And what's really important aren't the peaks, it's the RMS. So notice where the solid bar hits on the drums. Okay, so my RMS on the drums is hitting about negative 20, negative 19. And that's pretty much right in the zone for a lot of the standard advice when you go to your beginner production tutorial courses and so on. They say, you know, set your drums to peak around negative 12. And in most cases, that means the drums will probably be having an RMS around negative 18. And if you set your drums there, especially your kick, and then mix everything else up to that level, that reference point, right? That'll put you in the right sweet spot and that'll probably leave you about 6 dB of headroom on the master and you know, that's the advice. And that's exactly what this track is doing. Now it's very quiet um, compared to my voice. So I'm gonna turn up the whole master right now. I just want you to remember as I keep going forward with this video, that this really does have 6 dB of headroom on it, but now I'm artificially pushing it a little higher just so you can hear this better against my voice. Now, let's look at what happens when you compare this with a reference track. So I'm using one of my own mixes from a few years ago. Um, one of my own songs published out there on all the, the standard platforms. And we're just going to go back and forth by clicking this button. And you can hear that, you know, and you can see with these spectrum analyzers, my mix is in the same ballpark as this reference track. Okay, now I want you to notice for those two different tracks to sound similar in loudness, I had to drop the gain on this song by 15 dB, okay? In other words, my real song that's published is at competitive loudness for this kind of genre. It's up there hitting around negative seven luffs on the loudest drop section that, you're, that we were listening to. Um, this mix right now is just incredibly quiet compared to everything else out there on the platform that I might be publishing, you know, this mix for. So, yes, yes, Spotify normalizes, all the different platforms normalize. Trust me, it, this would still sound louder for a whole bunch of reasons that we'll understand as this series goes on and I explain more about Clip to Zero. Um, but the main point I want to I want to make is, you know, spectrally, they sound similar, right? There, it's, this new mix is in the ballpark. This little loop is in the ballpark. Nothing wrong with it, nothing glaring. It's got sub energy, it's got a good round kick, it's got a nice snappy snare. Maybe not as much high-end information, but I didn't wanna spend a lot of time building this out. This is just a demo for this video. So listen to it one more time. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay. Now, you've done all this hard work. You've spent hours agonizing over your arrangement, agonizing over your sound design choices and processing those sounds so that kick sounds full and the sub sounds just right, can still be heard on small speakers and, you know, everything's leveled and balanced and you've done some final polishing EQ and other tricks, right? So you get to mastering and here's what it looks like. Now we're only hitting about negative 22 bluffs. That's very, very quiet. This song is destined for an EDM playlist. So I need to be hitting at least negative eight, ideally more like negative seven bluffs. Maybe arguably you could say some producers and engineers out there are starting to try and pull, pull the standard down to negative nine in some genres of EDM. But it's got to be up around negative nine, negative eight, negative seven loves, or it's not going to be competitive when you put it out there. So let's drive it up and see what happens. Now, I've got this in a mode where it's compensating the volume as I push the drive up. It's going to keep it the same apparent loudness just so you can hear where the, the limiter is starting to hit too hard and cause problems. So let's see what happens as I try to push this up. And I want you to pay attention to this bar on the right-hand side called S. That's short-term luffs. I'm trying to get this as close to seven as I can. Watch what happens. Okay, so now I'm going to reset the meter and we're going to measure what this is hitting in integrated loves. That's your average loudness. Okay, so I'm hitting negative seven loves. It's needing to do as much as 11 decibels of gain reduction on certain peaks. Right? Um, now, how does this sound compared to the original? Well, we can find that out by clicking this little button here on and off. This is just going to bypass it. So when this is red, you're going to hear the original mix. And when this is not red, you're going to hear the mastered to competitive loudness mix. Here we go. And there's the problem in a nutshell. This is what's wrong with the way everyone learns how to produce. <laughs> this is what's wrong. This is something every producer struggles with at some point. I certainly struggled with it. Uh, I get comments every day from people who struggled with this. And when they figure out my clip to zero approach, they go, holy crap. I, I had no idea it was so easy to get around this because I used to thrash on this. This is just how it works. If you follow standard advice meant for the old days of, you know, analog desks and recording bands in studios and working on equipment that needed the signal to be running at a, at a fairly constant level around 18 RMS, if you follow that old school advice, you're always going to get to the mastering stage and you're always going to run into this where your mix falls apart. Your beautiful mix you spent hours making falls apart. Okay, now professional mastering engineers who know what they're doing and have experience with louder genres, well, they have a whole bag of tricks to fix your shitty mixes <laughs> that can't be made loud at home using a limiter like I just showed you. They have a whole bag of tricks. They they've, they've honed their art so they can get around this problem. But if you're a home studio producer and you don't want to shell out for professional mastering, um... You're, you're screwed. This is what you end up with. And then you, so you, then you go, well, what do I need to change so that I can actually push it this loud? And then you, you screw up your mix. 
trying to figure out how to make it sound right at the target loudness you're trying to hit to be competitive with everyone else out there. So even professional mastering engineers, they're still just slapping band-aids on things. And I'll be talking about that in a minute. It's still something they could do a much better job at as a pro if you hand them a mix that's designed to be loud right from the beginning. This mix sounds great in the old school way of doing things, but it is not built to be loud. And that's why it falls apart as soon as you try to push it through a mastering limiter and do this final push, right? So that's the problem in a nutshell. So now that I've kind of demoed it, let's talk a little bit about the different elements from that first slide. To really understand clip to zero, it all revolves around gain staging. Now, I already kind of described how this project was originally gain staged. And gain staging means two different things. It's basically, on one level, it's the overall RMS level and headroom that you decide to work at in your project, right? So my headroom was lots and lots of empty space above the peaks. In fact, by the time all these things summed together and rolled up to the master, I still had a headroom of negative six, meaning my peak was at least six below zero, okay? And then all these tracks had massive amounts of headroom. The drums were hitting at negative four, but look at the headroom on these other tracks, negative 24, negative 24, that's 24 dBs from the highest peak of this track to, to the full scale zero mark in digital, okay? This one was 14 below zero. This was 12 below zero, right? That's the headroom. And so this is one meaning. It's like, what is the overall level you work at? Now, another meaning of gain staging, and this is where newcomers get confused. There are a few special types of plugins out there in the world that need to be driven at a certain input level or they sound wrong, okay? Now, most of these plugins are what we call vintage plugins or analog modeled plugins. A good example, uh, if I, I'll just pick a random track here. What would I call the CLA 76, right? Okay, here's a, here's a classic example. This is the Ure 1176, famous compressor. People like it on drums, especially. Now, all of the versions of the 1176 that are out there by different vendors, they're trying to simulate or emulate how analog works, okay? And this compressor is very sensitive to how much input signal you're driving into it. If you drive too much input signal, if it's too hot, it's not going to have the famous response that everyone loves. If you drive it too low with not enough RMS, it's not going to have the response that it's famous for. So, you know, the manual for this plugin and the manual for all kinds of plugins like this, they always tell you what the sweet spot is. They tell you what input signal you should drive into it. Sometimes they'll say it should be negative 18 RMS. Sometimes they'll say it, they'll give it to you in a peak value. They'll say, drive the signal at negative 12 peak. Drive the signal at negative 10 peak. Drive the signal at negative six peak, right? They'll, they'll give you these numbers to kind of get you in the right ballpark. And so the whole trick is when you use a plugin like this, and we've got it on this track here, right? If I've got this plugin here, I typically need to use something from my DAW that lets me adjust the volume in front of this plugin. Okay, now in, in Bitwig, this utility device is called Tool. In Ableton Live, it's called Utility. In Studio One, it's called Mix Tool, and so on and so forth. Every DAW has some kind of trim control that you can bring in. And it literally just lets you increase or decrease the volume or gain of the signal in front of, well, in the middle of a signal chain. So I could have a whole bunch of different processors in this insert channel for this track. And here's the processor I'm focused on. And because this processor is one of those little special snowflake vintage processors, I need to probably either pull the volume down or maybe even push the volume up to send a signal that's just at the right sweet spot for this particular plugin. 
And almost all of these plugins, they have a way to like check the metering on the input. And the idea is you're supposed to be seeing, you know, the peaks never go more than, uh, well, <laughs> actually this particular one, they say set the input to negative 12 peak. And so this is a negative, this is a full scale dB meter. And here's the negative 12 mark. So ideally, I would play this track and then adjust my input into this plugin until this needle right here on the input channel is popping at negative 12 on its peaks. That's how you set this one, and they're all different, right? And by the time I did that, if I go to the you know gain reduction meter, I should then be seeing my needle hovering around zero. This is more of a standard VU meter. And yes, if you're new to this stuff, it is confusing as hell. My advice is stay away from the damn vintage plugins, especially if you do electronic music. Most of this is um, eh, it's meh. The benefits you get from this stuff, I know some people out there will get mad and argue with me about that, but that's okay. Um, point is, this is another part of gain staging is you have to think about across all your plugins on the track, do you need to push gain up or pull gain down as you're moving through your signal chain? And if I, for example, if, if I had to drop this track by 6 dB to give this plugin what it needed at its sweet spot, then on the other side of this plugin, I might want to duplicate this and put another tool on the other side and then crank it up by positive 6 dB, right? And that way, here's my original signal coming in at whatever level. I drop it down by negative 6 to feed this one particular plugin the level it needs. And then on the other side, the output of this plugin, I crank the signal back up to its original level again. Boom. Done. And then I can put my other normal processing on after this, right? So this is another aspect of gain staging driving certain plugins at the sweet spot they need for their specific modeled response. Now, the good news is most of the plugins we use today do not care about this. They, they do not have a sweet spot. Um, most plugins have what's called a linear response. And you can hit them with as hot a signal as you want or as quiet a signal as you want and the plugin will respond exactly the same, no matter. You could give it something that's peaking at zero. You could give most modern plugins something that's going way above zero, and they will act just the same as if you were giving them a signal that was coming in at negative 18 RMS, okay? So don't worry too much about this. Just be aware that that's one aspect of gain staging uh, is, is controlling the level of the signal on your tracks. And we'll talk about that because that kind of control here in your inserts is an important part of the clip to zero strategy. Um, and then I guess the last thing to talk about is I want to point out for those of you that are familiar with Bob Katz's K system, if, you're, if you've heard about the K system of working, my clip to zero method is effectively a K system approach. The difference is I'm not down at K20 or K14 or K12. Clip to zero is basically saying, what is the competitive loudness of your genre? Most of the songs are hitting negative seven to negative six lefts. Well, then you need to work at K6 or K7. Uh, okay, you, you want to be close to competitive, but you don't you want to retain as much dynamics as you can. So maybe you make the choice to mix your track so that the loudest sections are hitting more like negative eight luffs or negative nine luffs. You're not quite up there with the loudest of the loud in that genre, but you're close and you're okay with that because you're just having trouble really hitting negative seven or negative six, right? So Let's say you pick negative nine. I'm gonna make this song roughly fall out around negative nine loves at its loudest sections. So that would kind of be the equivalent of a K9, okay? It's all about the RMS, the LUFs, the average energy, the K system in short, and a lot of DAWs have K system meters, even Bitwig can switch to K system metering if you want. Instead of showing you the RMS and the peak values in the meter, a K system approach, hides the peaks from you. It just says, look, 
you the zero point on the meter, if you're in K20 and there's a zero on the meters, heck, can I do this real quick? Just to show you. <laughs> this will be fun. Meter mode, there we go, K20. Okay, so Bitwig offers K20. So if we come back here, you'll notice my meters now have a zero right here. But this zero, all it means is it's negative 20 RMS. And if I play this track now, See, the, the bars are going up the same amount. It's just that zero point is negative 20 RMS. And honestly, they shouldn't even be showing me the peak marks. They're, this is a bad implementation of K-System. Sorry, Bitwig. Uh, I never use K-System. So in other, other DAWs like Studio One, they'll hide the peaks from you. You won't even see them. You'll just see the solid bars. So again, it was right here at negative 20. Okay, so all K-System does, the idea behind a real K-System implementation is they won't even let you look at the peaks because the peaks just, just confuse you. We mix by loudness. We mix by the perceived loudness of every track and every, every signal running through our project. So I'm K-System. The clip to zero method is basically K-System pushed way up high around negative eight, negative seven, negative six, or whatever loudness you're trying to hit. And if the peaks are going over zero, that's fine because we clip them at zero. So the peaks never really go above zero, they stop right at zero. But we're focusing on working in a high RMS. And that's what allows you to have the next important point about the whole clip to zero method, which is that apples to apples comparison with your reference tracks. I showed you this problem where when I compared this, this song to my reference track, it sounded the same because my reference track was pushed way, way, way quiet. But as soon as I tried to push the song itself up to the same loudness as my reference track, everything fell apart. So clearly I wasn't really hearing my mix and how it would sound at the actual RMS level or loudness level of my reference track. And this is a problem we all face as producers. You get a reference track, you buy some fancy software, or you just put it in track in your DAW and by ear adjust it so they're roughly the same loudness so you can hear them side by side. And you think you're working apples to apples, but you're not, you're not. And I demonstrated that earlier. So here's the problem. If you make your highly dynamic mix, and by dynamic, I mean lots of high peaks above the RMS. Look at, look at these peaks. Look at that huge gap between the skinny peak lines and the RMS. The only track that doesn't have any gap is the sub because the sub is just like, there is no peaks, it's one solid sign signal, right? But everything else has these really wide gaps. That's That indicates you have a lot of dynamics in that signal. And there's whole philosophical wars out there about dynamics are best, dynamics actually increase perceived loudness, yada, yada. Well, they don't, they don't really. Um, <laughs> which, which again will become more apparent as this series goes on. The problem is if you have, a, if you're working in a really dynamic kind of mix gain staging level, and you make it sound as hot, if you make it sound the same as your reference tracks, then when you finally crush it with the mastering limiter, everything gets turned into mush because you made everything too wrong. You made a dynamic mix sound the same way as a very not dynamic mix. Your reference tracks are not dynamic if they're from a loud genre. A, a track hitting seven luffs in its loudest sections has almost no microdynamics in it. It's pinched right to the edge of, of screaming like I have no actual dynamics. So you cannot do a mix 
in a dynamic way and make it sound to your ear the same as your reference track that's working in a very, very small dynamic range, because then you have that mismatch that makes everything fall apart in mastering. That's what I was trying to demonstrate at the beginning. And then the other thing to really know about this is despite their name, a quote-unquote mastering limiter is a really sucky tool. They're terrible tools. They really do not they do not like to work. They don't like to be stressed. They like to do tiny amounts of dynamic control. They like to barely touch the peaks. If you make them do massive negative 4 dB of game reduction, negative 6 dB of game reduction, negative 8 dB of game reduction, negative 11, it's just going to destroy everything. Okay? They're meant to be very transparent. But the way new producers tend to use them, they're not transparent at all because you're asking them to do way too much work. So mastering what the professionals do, in many ways, it's the art of slapping band-aids on bad mixes. This mix here is a bad mix. It sounds great, but it's not designed to be loud. It's not designed to actually be possible to even make competitively loud with all the other professional tracks in that same general genre, okay? It's a bad mix. Even though it sounds good, it's not good. Now, mastering engineers have a lot of tools in their toolkit, a lot of tricks and techniques in their toolkit to fix your terrible bad mixes like this. And they can, in many cases, make it sound pretty good at negative seven loves or negative eight loves, but they're using tricks you don't have access to, okay? Uh, and even, even for them, the limiter itself is the, is the last ditch tool. It's like they do a whole bunch of other crazy tricks first so that their mastering limiters at the end are only doing a small amount of final lift, okay? Nobody, nobody who's a pro tries to get negative 6 dB out of a mastering limiter, negative 6 gain reduction, or even negative 4, right? They try to fix everything that's wrong with your mix in various ways before they throw that final mastering limiter on there to get at the last mile towards, you know, whatever your target loudness is. So this is just something to be aware of, is, is by working in CTZ, you're already working in a very low dynamic range at the same level as your reference tracks, and so you're truly working apples to apples and you're finding problems before they show up. So that brings us to how it works, why it works. Okay, so clip to zero forces you to be aware of and to control the dynamics of every single track and bus signal, okay? And by awareness, I mean literally looking at the waveform, seeing the waveform. So I'm gonna show you an example here. Um, We're going to drop an oscilloscope on a couple tracks. We'll do, we'll do the drums and the sub just as an example. And I'm going to duplicate this over here. And then I'm also going to duplicate a copy of this over on my master track in front of the limiter. Okay. So you'll notice I've got three things here now that say master, drums, and sub. And... Um, Let's see, let's make it, is my dot text and dot color okay? I guess I didn't get fancy with my colors here. But let's uh, play the track now and just, I'm gonna click to these different channels and show you something. So with an oscilloscope like this, this is called a multi-channel oscilloscope. 
I can have up to eight instances of this on my project, and I can analyze individual tracks, see what their waveforms look like. Like here's big peaky kick hits and, and snare hits. Here's my sub is very even. Here's what the final combined signal uh, of everything looks like on my master channel. And then a good oscilloscope of this type will also let you choose which two signals you want to see and see them layered together, maybe stacked on top of each other, and most importantly, summed. So this here is showing me what the drum and the sub bus look like when they are summed together. Look at the difference. Do you see how, like, okay, here's the kick hit, I, and it's, it's not being overlapped by the sub. There's a little bit of a delay there. But look at this spot right here where the sub and the kick and the snare, these two hits right here, overlay in this area. Watch what happens when I click sum. See how now the combined signal is much peakier than before? Okay, that's summing. And this is a really important thing to be aware of because it'll surprise you how signals sum and how suddenly new big peaks that weren't there before are appearing in the summed result. So the point is, um, you want to be... Um, <laughs> let's find my right thing here. Yeah. You want to really be aware of and be able to see the waveform and understand how the waveforms sum. And that means using some kind of oscilloscope that is beat synced and multi-channel. And for Windows, my favorite one is SciScope Pro. That's what I was just showing you. I work on Windows. On Macintosh, there's a, a similar kind of scope called Ozillos Megascope by Schultz Audio. So you're going to want to pick those up at some point if you get serious about this method. All right, let's move on. The other thing that Clip to Zero does is it's forcing you to clip at all your bus points, which exposes flaws in your arrangement, sound design, and your mixing decisions. Now, what I mean by that, let's just pull up a new project here. Let me bring up my standard project template. Switch this to, okay. So here's kind of a mixing view. Let me collapse some of these that are open by default. All right, so all these little colored bars indicate groups, groups or buses. So I have some sounds in my drops bus. I have some sounds in my chords bus. I have some sounds in my melody bus, and then the melody bus, chords bus, and drops bus are all summing together in a higher level bus called midline, right? And midline is sitting next to subs, vocals, drop interjects, and all four of these buses are summing into a higher level bus called tonal. Okay, all my tonal sounds, not my drum sounds. And then over here in the drum section, I've got, you know, individuals, tops and snares and kicks. And those three sub buses um, are being summed together into a drums bus. And then finally, my tonal bus and drums bus are kept separate until the very last minute. And then they're summed together on a bus called pre-master. And pre-master is where I do some final processing before I finally send it over to my master. So the point is, at all of these buses, you'll notice I've got this thing called bus CTZ, bus CTZ. Every signal that comes, rolls up into a bus and gets summed together, I've got a method for handling the, the peaks and clipping the peaks of those new peaks caused by all these different sounds summing together at that bus. And this is a, a standard part of my strategy that we'll talk about as this series goes on. So by clipping automatically at all your buses, you're instantly going to hear problems. You're instantly going to hear problems with your arrangement, your sound design, and your mixing decisions, okay? So let's talk about what these three aspects are and what kind of flaws show up. Loudness doesn't start in your mix. It doesn't start at your master. It starts before either of those. It starts with how you arrange and sequence your song in the first place. If you have a bad arrangement and you're trying to work in a loud genre, 
If your arrangement isn't lending itself to a loud result, then it's going to force you to make some tough mixing decisions and it's going to force you to make compromises and it's it's going to make things sound bad. If you don't arrange well from the beginning with an eye towards loudness, if you work in loud genres, eh, then you're going to be really constricted and constrained when it comes to mixing. So by clipping at the buses, you instantly hear problems and that helps you recognize some bad arrangement choices while you're still arranging, while you're still composing your mix. You go, oh wait, I shouldn't stack those two sounds on top of each other. Maybe I should spread them out a little bit in time so they're not summing together. I've got two really loud things. I don't want them happening at the same time. I want to put them side by side. And then they're both loud and they don't cause problems and my mastering limiter won't scream later when I try to crush both of those into the mastering limiter. Um, so that's one aspect of it. Now, some typical arrangement choices that can affect loudness, okay? If you have a lot of horizontal arrangements, which means a bunch of layered sounds happening at the same exact moment, or sounds that overlap in little short places for at any specific point in time, the more layering and overlapping you have, the more your arrangement will struggle to be loud and it will start forcing you to make bad mixing decisions and compromises, okay? By contrast, vertical arrangements, checkerboarded arrangements are easy to make loud. And this is why EDM sounds the way it does. Column response, right? Boom, chack, boom, chack. You don't have things overlapping the kick and snare. They're the loudest things in the song. They're next to the kick and the snare. It's kick is loud, the sound, the, the downbeat growl is loud, but it doesn't happen at the same time as the kick transient. It happens after the kick transient, right? So by vertically arranging your, your mix, vertically sequencing, it's a lot easier to get loud. Um, the other thing that causes problems is when, when you have any kind of stacking of transients, and this happens a lot in drums, uh, amateur drums, newbie drums, right? All those hi-hats and shakers and, you know, drum tops that you layer in with your kick and your snare, it's tempting to put those right on the grid so that some of them are hitting at the same time as the kick and the snare, and all that does is make the peaks of the kick and the snare even higher. It's summing. They're summing together. So then you, your limiter or clippers have to smash the kick and the snare even more at higher level buses like the drum bus and the final master bus. And that's just going to squash your kick and snare into oblivion, right? So you need to get those hi-hats off the kick and the snare, move them away from the kick and the snare. So that's an arrangement decision, right? Um, it's also, some people think of ducking, sidechain ducking, as a kind of mix step, but I think of it as an arrangement step too. I'm always thinking about ducking right up at the very beginning of my arrangement. Okay, my kick and snare are the loudest things. I don't want anything competing with them or overlapping with them or stacking with them. So I need to make sure every bus that contains a sound that hits at the same time as my kick and snare has a ducker on it so they duck when the kick and snare hit. That's an arrangement decision. And then I kind of talked about staggered transients like in a, a top loop for drums. So these are just some really basic high level decisions that you know affect how loud you can get easily. Um, then the next thing to talk about is that loudness continues with your sound design, right? This is another aspect of what clipping at your buses will let you hear problems with, right? Some sounds just cannot be made loud enough to work in loud genres. I can't stress that enough. Burn this into your brain. This was the best advice Seth Drake ever gave me. Some sounds simply cannot be loud enough, okay? So what do we mean by that? Well, a big, round, warm, boomy kick struggles really hard in a loud mix. If you have a fat, juicy, thumpy, boomy kick, and you're trying to write an EDM banger, a bass music banger that's going to hit negative seven or negative six, I'm sorry, that kick is going to die. It's going to die. You can't do it. And if you're working clip to zero, you'll hear it the instant you try it. 
you'll go, wait a minute, that cake just doesn't work. It just starts get sounding squashed and flubby and rubbery and, and wrong. So what you'll notice if you pay attention is in loud genres, people tend to prefer thinner, knocky sounding kicks that don't actually have much low end sine wave tail on them. They're, they're more transient than anything else, right? And it's all your sub basses and mid basses that are providing that bottom end feel. And you might have a sub bass that's coming in right after that thin, knocky transient kick. And so it sounds like a normal boomy kick, but it's not. It's really a super thin, knocky kick with, that's being doubled or layered or kind of sequenced very close next to a sub, subby sound of some sort. Um, and that's just a, a basic trick that every electronic producer eventually learns, <laughs> right? You can't use fat kicks. If you do, you, you might have to change them a lot when it comes to your drop sections, but it's better to just start with a thin knocky kick in general and use tricks to make it sound like a boomy kick in your intros and breakdowns and so on. Um, so another place that we have problems, any kind of nuanced sound with nuanced transients. Now I'm talking that beautiful, delicate piano, that beautiful, really prickly sounding arp or, or pluck or something, right? I mean, depending on the sound, if it has lots of dynamics or part of the characteristic timbre of the sound, well, I'm sorry, they're gonna struggle in louder genres. Instead, louder genres tend to prefer aggressive sounds that have very hot, saturated, and distorted transients. You want sounds that sound good when they're saturated and distorted. Those are real easy to put into a loud mix and use in a loud mix. So, like it or not, it's just how it is. And what that, what that kind of brings us to is um, the next part, which is your mixing decisions, right? Your quest for loudness also relies a lot on your mixing decisions. And there's a few basic mixing decisions that very much affect your ability to get loud and work in a small dynamic range. One thing is that uh, you pretty much have to side chain everything to the kick and snare, even your effects returns, even your aux returns, if you use them. People always forget that. Even those things have to be done because even though they're fairly quiet, by the time they sum with all your other tracks at the master, they're adding a lot of energy. And if you're not ducking them out of the way of the kick and the snare, they're going to make your kick and snare way peakier than the kick and snare need to be. And then the kick and snare get crushed by the final clippers and limiters on the master track and sound bad. And you wonder why they sound bad. So side chain ducking is super important. Um, a lot of times in louder genres, you want to, especially if you do bass music, you want to have your sub louder than at first you're comfortable with. That's just kind of a given. I'm not going to go into that too much, but the more sub energy you have, the harder it is to make things loud too. So it's kind of a, a bit of a catch-22. Um, typically, you're going to want a lot of saturation on your various sounds and, of course, clipping or limiting on your, your sounds because... The RMS is high, so a lot of those peaks will be going over zero. Um, you want to do a lot of EQ bracketing. Um, what this means is things like on your mid-range and lead sounds, you typically put a roll-off, like a, a, a low pass with a, a gentle 12 dB slope, usually at around 7 kHz, 7 kilohertz, because you really want your high end to mostly be like your drum tops, your cymbals, sounds like that in a lot of cases. It depends, depends on the song. And then, you know, it's very common on your bass sounds and your mid bass sounds to put a high pass filter around here and roll off the sub because you want your sub sounding clean and you have a different sub track for that. So, you know, this is important to think about because if you let all that energy on the extreme ends stack up, where they're not important to be able to hear for that particular instrument, then you have way too much energy for the, the clippers and limiters across your, your project to deal with. Um, and we'll get into that in a lot more detail in later episodes. You also need to think about spreading your sounds out in the mid side arrangement, you know, the stereo field. 
any kind of sound that happens at the same time needs to be spread out for better clarity and also to keep the energy spread out across the stereo field. You also want a lot of um, placement of your front to back depth of sounds that happen at the same time. A placement front to back depth in your sound stage is usually done with time domain effects like delays and reverbs and other tricks. So that's something we'll get into in a later episode. Um, one thing that can give a sense of loudness is kind of hyping the upper mids that we're sensitive to, and you do that with saturation or EQ. And finally, in loud genres, you often need to mix your vocals really, really, really hot and bright. I did a couple videos recently that uh, go into this in a lot more detail. So you need to do that with spectral ducking to make things sit out front. And then finally, just a, you know, final thoughts here. Using clip to zero gain staging helps you to understand and make two really important trade-offs. And this is, I get this question a lot. I want to work with dynamic sounds. I really like dynamic instruments. I need, you know, I, I just like dynamics. Can I use clip to zero for that? And it's like, yes, you can. And clip to zero will actually help you make certain decisions better, even if you want to work in a very dynamic way. But there's a trade-off involved here. You don't get you don't get loudness for free. Loudness requires compromises. It means you have to make certain decisions in your arrangement, your sound design, and your mixing. And so the trade-off is basically, look, if you want to have more freedom with your arrangement and more freedom with your sound design, you have to just be prepared to have a, an end result that's quieter maybe than the genre you're trying to work in, okay? You have to accept the constraints of the genre. If you're working in a genre that is competitively loud and you need to sound like everyone else, well, you're going to have to accept less freedom when it comes to your sound design and arrangement. And that's just an important expectation I want to set up front. So that's it. Thanks for sticking with me and we'll move on to the next episode. See you next time.